I do want to ask him um, about spirituality with um, and self healing with the writing. Um, just any general, uh, I guess, what comes to your heart when you hear those two words: spirituality, self healing, um, writing with self healing, or expression um, with self healing. Well, I definitely think writing is a great outlet, and you know, some people don't feel like they're writers, but the thing about writing is you don't have to be a writer to just use writing as a creative tool to express yourself. Like you can literally just start out by writing anything like my name is Asha, today was whatever, and then things will just flow out of you. And I feel like writing, people don't like it because you have to be very vulnerable. It's, it's a part of you that really comes forward. It's not like doing math or you have a formula. It's just very who you are and what you have to say. And a lot of people maybe aren't comfortable with that, but I feel like if more people did use writing as a tool and, and use it to work through their thoughts, it would help them heal because it's helped me heal um, a lot and it's helped me express myself and my spirituality, um, not even so much in terms of my religion because I am Christian, but just being like realizing energy, like positive energy and, and good and not so much um, tying it to religion, but just understanding how writing can help you just open up yourself more and, and just take in and also put out yeah um it, it's crazy because because i write all the time i became very um i've become very i don't know how even to say this kind of detached from my feelings towards writing at first i always had a journal i kept the journal on me like you know it's what i love to do as a kid but when it became like i said like so routine that love of writing definitely evaporated like it so now i'm kind of focusing more on other ways besides writing to express my spirituality to to self-heal um and that's that's a little hard because i know writing is my home i know writing is my base and i know that's where i want to take my career but it's like i have gotten so um it there's no more emotion involved in it there's no more feeling there's no more humanity left in my writing i feel like because it's just so like i said so straight and narrow um all the time and i can't because there's no well now thanks to quarantine i got a break to finally kind of um unlock some things that i've kind of just kept away like in my thoughts just because i just hung it up i put it behind me and because i had a, a routine i had a curriculum that i had to follow um, like I said, writing became very uh, bleak to, to kind of, like the best way to describe it, um, very emotionless. So I try to find different ways to express myself, um, whether that be through meditating or maybe through prayer, like just to get some form of expression that had nothing to do with the pen and paper. Um, but now I see with every, one with everything going on and with Lucid Visionaries, I was like, okay, well, how can we detach ourselves from work and from you, from a journal, from just a very singular perspective? Um, and that's kind of what I've been trying to do during quarantine. At least that's my excuse. I'm just trying to um, find out a little bit more about myself and my dislikes and what I, what I do like and if writing is even a part of that. So that so it sucks that I kind of have a different um, uh, way of going about it than Asha does but just with it just being such a burden a lot of the times because writing and I think that's what turns people off like Asha said it's no math problem like there's no formula there's no boundary and um some people may view writing as tedious you think writing you think essay you think paper you know what I'm saying you think school homework that's what you think about writing and not about how much of a lease it can be so it sucks that I don't have that feeling towards it, at least right now. Um, hopefully that love again will return, but right now I'm trying to find different ways to express that. Um, and it's more so through talking and it's been through just saying what's on my mind more um, in real time um, or recording things if I'm with my sisters or I'm out with my friends, just trying to document um, the regular things, the normal stuff, um, what I do day to day. Uh, like I say, it just um, and how that connects to like the spirituality part of it. I think um, I think I began to lose faith in myself uh, 
as writing became more of a, a chore for me and um, just kind of finding, you know, what makes me tick, what makes me me and how, um, how that may not include writing right now. So that's, it's just a little weird that I'm thinking of a life without it. Mm -hmm. because I feel like it, it held me back ironically, although that's what I want to do in life. I feel like at a, at a certain point it got just very, I don't know, <laughs> writing just became more so of an enemy because it was just so like so wired and so technical um so that's why i hope that this blog can get me out of that you know and it has i, I feel like it had it made me want to write about every day you know what i'm saying about what's going on with me so it was uh, a nice change of pace definitely to get me out of that that part how it was just like just so I don't know. Everything was so um, monetized because that's how I looked at it. I got, I get paid to write for my newspaper, which is a benefit. But that's how I looked at it. It was just a check I wrote just so I could get some money. Um, but to do this and to just do it for me or do it for Asha, do it for anybody who was reading, like it, it felt really, 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 really good. Yeah, and I think that's one of the good parts about writing is like when I read Karan's piece, it was like. I really connected to the things that she was saying, especially about the microaggressions, because I feel like that's a thing a lot of people of color, a lot of minorities face. But it's like, how can we point that out without looking like the aggressor, especially as black women? Like, we're always forced to kind of shrink ourselves. And, and if we were to say anything against that, you know, it would be like, oh, well, you know, why are you being defensive? Why are you being aggressive? Why are you trying to call me out? It's not even that deep. But people don't realize how subtle like these things go, how these microaggressions go and how they really do affect you. And I've had like a similar experience where there was a period of time where I just did not want to write because it was just tedious and it wasn't really about expressing myself, but it was just too hard. Like I had writer's block. And this was when going back to how I had, you know, um, started with Lucid Visionaries two years ago. And then I just completely fell off when I became depressed and I didn't want to write my papers for school, anything like that. And it's because I feel like writing does require you to to be open it does require you to think but just allow yourself to to express yourself and and it sucks when you know that is your outlet and that becomes like just robotic and and you just lose that passion and i definitely feel like uh that's something a lot of people experience and it's hard when especially in quarantine like it's hard when you can't go anywhere or can't do anything so then you have to find other ways outside of that to try and express yourself but then you want to keep expressing yourself like you feel called to because everything's going on and it's so much you feel like you have to say something but then those feelings with I don't want to write it's just like it can be really hard to balance and yeah, yeah. did you have a question to share I don't want to I I'm I just feel like like you're you guys have helped like a lot of women today and like a lot of people today because um i feel like i'm inspired to write now <laughs> and i don't and what i what i realized just hearing you guys talk is that um i don't want to write about my trauma um that's something that i do not want to face feel again um i i do want to like solve like like what you said with the math problem i've never heard it um expressed like this before but what you said about the math problem, I, I do want it to be soft, like trauma and things that are going on right now with the country and da 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 da, da but that process of, like, uh, we all, you know, have gone through our depressions and stuff, but, like, to have to rewrite about your depression or about a microaggression that I didn't even feel comfortable expressing to my friends because... Do I seem out of pocket? Do I, it doesn't seem like they're even gonna believe me. Is my story even matter to them? Da, 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 da. And I, I, I feel like um, what you're doing right now with this blog and you know, you got your home backing you up and <laughs> everything like that. Yes, and I, I love it. And I just want y'all to know it's, it has definitely unlocked something in me, just being able to read those articles and then being able to talk to you all, I, I hope this helps other people um, unlock that part of themselves where uh, to give us the courage to face those things happening. Because you do feel so alone and it's nice to not feel alone anymore with stuff like that. And um, 
I don't know if black women always get a chance to talk to one another like this and to be able to, cause I'm not in college anymore and I don't always have that space anymore to talk to other young black uh, American women who are going through these things right now. And so just even having that is really replenishing um, and refreshing. So I just want to say thank you. Where do you see your blog going in a few years from now? <laughs> well, see, I, I really don't know because I had never intended for Lucid Visionaries to be a blog. Like that was just something that came about in quarantine. So um, uh, okay. I never was like, yeah. So it, it was like a cool way for me to have this outlet for other people to come. But that's not how I originally intended it to be. But it has opened my eyes to like other possibilities. But what I mainly want to do with Lucid Visionaries is I want to go into communities, urban communities or communities where kids are disadvantaged. And I want to give them like better outlets, better resources, better programs. Like if money wasn't an issue, what I probably would do is rebuild schools, um, you know, give them technology, laptops, um, things in their schools. Because a lot of times in these communities, they don't have that access to technology. They go home, they don't have Wi-Fi. You know, they come to school, their schools are so run down. It's like, why would I want to go to school? I don't want to be in this environment for eight hours a day, you know? So I would want to do something like that, or I would want to build community centers because spaces, like just give them spaces to come and be themselves, to grow their talents, where they can go swim, where they can play basketball, where they can um, paint, you know, anything like that, instead of having to constantly be surrounded by things that tell them that they're not worth anything. And so that's what I really want to do with this with visionaries. That's what I would hope to do. And so like Stakani was talking about before, like I was saying, you know, I don't really have any money right now. Like I don't really have any sponsors, things like that. But it, it's just about building this up, getting this out there for people to see and, and for people to be on board. You know, the bigger, the more people who support, the, the more change I'll be able to make, I feel like. So that's really what I want to do in the coming years. And my inspiration for Lucid Visionaries, I always talk about Khalif Bard because that really was, seeing his story really did put me on this path. Like we all have one thing that we saw that like really, you know, changes us and motivates us. And it was that for me. And so what I want to do as a big part of Lucid Visionaries and, you know, preventing people from, who live in urban communities from having to feel like they can only live one way, you know, in the streets or anything like that, giving them opportunity to do more and preventing and helping them. If they do end up incarcerated, I want to help reintegrate them into society because a big part of Khalif's story is he was saying, you know, I just wish I could take a break. I just wish I could get away, get out, you know. He was going to school, doing what he needed to do to try and turn his life around after, you know, they stole it from him, but he just couldn't get a break. He couldn't get away. And so that's what I want to do for kids. I want to help them get away and just have another option. Like, that's it, because we, they don't have a lot of options. And then people wonder why they turn and do certain things, or why they're um, engaging in, in the streets and, and drugs and things like that. Well, you're not offering them anything else to do, you know? So that's just really what I want to do with my org. Well, yeah. Would you have something to say, Carl? Yeah, I was just gonna, I was just, when she was talking about Khalid Browder, like, um, how she said, you know, he wanted somewhere to get away, also from his head, like, it was a lot, of, it was a huge mental game that he was also mm -hmm. fighting through, so that aspect about these kid, kids living in these urban um, cities is not just what they physically and economically um, endure, but what they mentally endure, how these experiences can damage a young kid at a very young age, and how and that can Guarantee, like guarantee you can determine how they're going to live the rest of their lives um and it sucks that we're literally put into a box as a statistic you know what i'm saying these pipelines from schools to prisons like it it's literally it oppression has its hands and in, in, in all the games and everything so i think um i just wanted to emphasize what she said about having a place for them to get away you know not just physically but also for them to express emotion men and our young women very much so um and, and i really think that uh if you know hopefully that if i keep writing i will most likely keep writing that i you know relate to more people or whatever i go through to put it on page and i don't even think it's trauma. i think we should definitely try to um, um normalize just talking about regular things even if it has nothing to do with our race for change if it might just be about specific things that's going on um, personally about love, about fear, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, 
I think those are things that we should also be highlighting that we are human, we are people that go through regular days, that go through emotions, that cry, that bleed. And I think those um, regular stories uh, should also be highlighted as well. You know, so I think when I, I feel like literally when you think about black people or black community, it's it's literally coded in struggle. Like that's all we know, or at least that's the history that we're taught and that um, we kind of walk in today is that we always got to be kind of on defensive, whether it be from our own or from somebody outside of that. So I think it it sucks that kids, <clears throat> excuse me, that you have to go to protest, have to talk about these things. <clears throat> excuse me, but. I think, um, like Asha said, about just having a place for them to be kids, to be people, to be regular, you know, for a change, to just um, to just finally have an experience that doesn't have to be tied to doing bad or having bad things done to you um, because of things that that's out of your control. Yeah. And I think I, that's so hard. Yeah. Yeah, I was just um, going to say what you guys are, or what you're doing, Asha, with Lucid Visionaries. I feel like it's creating that space for people to talk about what they want to do and to see that there's something else about our expression other than just systematic oppression and us talking about being discriminated and prejudice and racism. And that's needed because I think for me, once I got out of school, it was kind of like, okay, I gotta be part of the system. I have to work and, you know, make money and do what I need to do for my family. And there was no place for, creativity or imagination and trying to get over that and be like well I have to be me and I have to express myself I know for a lot of people I talked to at the time it was difficult you go through like graduate depression where you're like okay well this is what I want to do with my life and, <laughs> that is real. <laughs> and this is what society is telling me to do with my life and I know there's some people that go, continuously go through that on an everyday basis, not just when they graduate. It's, you know, day one and throughout the rest of their lives. I've never heard that term. Wow. I've never heard that term, graduate depression. <laughs> yeah. so. well, I agree. And I think that, like, as you both are saying, it, it's really hard not to let because the black struggle is so complex and it's it's so overwhelming at times, if you just sit back and think about everything going on, it's hard to not let that become your identity. And and a lot of people in the black community will see like other people speaking out about this thing and they will say themselves, like, why are you always talking about race? You know, why are you always doing this and that? And I'm like, well, it's not that I'm always talking about race, it's just that race is, you know, at the center of everything. We can't not ignore, we can't not acknowledge it it's never going to go away people who say i don't see color you do because when you first see somebody you're automatically thinking oh what is this person that's just how we are that's just how it's always been and that's not just going to go away and it's hard to not let like people tell you what you are like as you were saying some people from day one and for the rest of their life they just go on being what other people say they are and you know that's a big part of oppression i feel like they want to not allow us they want to be so consumed in the struggle that we don't tap into our intellectualness we don't tap into our creativity we don't tap into the things that we're passionate about that would fuel us to go and then make a change they just want us to be so concerned with with the negative and, and keep us in that mindset and i think that's one of the main parts about mental liberation it, it is not just you know helping someone change their physical but also their mental and giving them the tools they need to do that yeah, well. so that they can, you know, live, be who they want to be and not what America always tries to tell us that we are and things like that. Yeah, I think that's very, that's very true. And just like looking at your Instagram posts and some of the images you, you put out and the art and even in some of your blogs, like the art that is within it really also brought to the forefront your writing and then the collaboration that you have there I think is necessary and needed to bridge that gap between okay like we can work together this is something that we, we can, can work together yeah but we can work together is is essential and we I feel for me like we can't separate every little thing and have different little groups in order to get ahead like we have to get ahead together I agree but I think something that comes to mind when you say that is 
it's like, well, do you mean like groups within black people or like communities, like everyone, like white people, Hispanic people, Asian people, black people all coming together? Um, I mean, I meant with like within the black community. So like just what yeah. came to mind was, um, honestly, I just drew blanks. So never mind. Because <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, when, I, when Sakani said that, I also thought, and I really loved, I, I didn't tell you this yet, but how you put James Baldwin and how you bring the past and use it to describe what's going on in the present. Because not everybody's familiar with James Baldwin. Not everybody's familiar with, um, yeah, or just like, um, I'm not all the way familiar with James Baldwin. And so I just appreciate um, you bringing some of the ancestors into the pieces, you know, and, and talking about that too. Yeah, yeah. I actually wanted to know um, your relationship with uh, James Baldwin's work and stuff like that. That makes sense. Is that the right Yeah, question? well, actually, <laughs> I didn't learn about him until my freshman year in college. And that course I took, it's called Color Lines and Borderlands. And that's where I was introduced to his work. And I was like, I read the first book I read by him was I'm Not Your Negro. And mm. it was eye opening, like literally it just gave me all the words I needed. I was introduced to Du Bois and I read The Souls of Black Folk, which I know me and Q have talked about before. And it's just like, yeah, I had, I've had i been living with this double consciousness. Like I've known, but I didn't know what it was called. I didn't know it was a thing, you know? And so once I started really like reading his work and then it just made me want to learn more about him. So I started looking at his other novels. No Name Ministry is my favorite by him. Um, it's kind of, some of his reads are like, I'm not gonna no lie. Name no Name Ministry. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I got the name. No name yeah. in the street. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. But a lot of his works, like, they're not, um, well, they are. Like, some of them are hard reads. Like, I'm reading them, I'm like, what is he trying to say here? And you have to reread it and, and oh. close read it and, you know, just make sure that you're getting what he's saying. But it's like, these are the works I feel like we should be reading in high school, not The Catcher in the Rye, not To Kill a Mockingbird. I'm like, why aren't we exposed to text by Black um, authors sooner and you know that's all a part of the brainwashing they just they don't want us to see our see our people as intelligent people who have thoughts that matter and things like that and so once I started reading yeah. about him I'm like yeah you know we, we definitely need to hear these opinions and, and hear about these writers because if more people to read them they would understand more about themselves yeah because that's just can you explain yeah yeah it, can you explain real quick for people who don't know about double consciousness with um, W.E.B. Du Bois? So basically when, as a person, as a black person at least, you always view yourself as from your own lens, like who I am in the world. But then because of oppression, you have a veil. So it's like the veil and you see how other people are seeing you all the time. So that's what Karam was saying, when you go into white spaces and then you feel like you're the only black person, it's like, oh, what are they thinking about me? You know, you're constantly viewing yourself like from what other people, how other people see you. And that's why you feel this doubleness, this two-ness, because it's like, oh, well, I'm thinking about how they see me and I'm also thinking about how I see myself. And it's very stressful trying to balance the two and to like not let it affect how you move in the world. And it, and it does, it did for me a lot. And I think it does for a lot of people of color. I know Q knows a lot about it, so if you want to say anything too. Yeah, uh, yeah. please. I, no, I, I'm actually reading The Souls of Black Folk currently, and it's, it's hard because you have to like search the words up while you read because, you know, he's a sociologist and he's, you know, just an educator. So a lot of the stuff, it's, it is hard to, it's hard to um, digest and also kind of dissect like, all the pieces that he's putting into there. Um, so that's what I'm reading now. And I have to put it down for a couple of days and then start back up because it is a lot. And um, we, like like Asha said, these are the books that we're supposed to be reading. So uh, so, so an actual professional, an actual teacher can help you um, dismantle these things because it is American history. These are actual like educators who were born in America. So why aren't these um, these narratives and these uh, pieces aren't pushed to the forefront? And I do think it, it is, um, so that is systematics, that is on purpose. Um, and uh, how my experience went in college, you, um, you kind of, you get to actually live those 
those books, you get to sit and actually understand and relate how they were feeling so long, not, not so long ago, a few decades ago, but how it can mean life and death for them at that time. Still now, still very much now, but um, of course it was much more um, in your face, much more obvious, much more extreme. Uh, but I think the importance is, is reading these books, is educating yourself at home so that you don't beat yourself up about it. So you don't feel like, well, because I am um, vulnerable, because I am at a disadvantage, I am the minority, that I am inferior. And that's the issue. And I think that's what comes with the double conscious is how you feel in your personal life, how your family makes you feel, how people who look like you make you feel, but then feeling so small in other spaces. Um, and that double consciousness can definitely be like, am I, am I inferior? You know what I'm saying? Will I ever be able to actually um, uh, see the fruits of my labor? Would I actually be able to um, break generational curses? It sucks that these are burdens that you think about at a very young age, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think my parents have done a lot for me. Um, that's an understatement. But my sisters and I always have conversations about what are we going to do better, though? You know what I'm saying? Not saying they were terrible parents, but how are we going to be better? You know, because there's certain things that they do that they um, that they emulate from their experiences um, as a Generation X, you know what I'm saying, who had boomers for parents and it just keeps going back. You know what I'm saying? It, everything that happened generations ago is affecting right now, is right now, you know? And I think that the importance about James Baldwin, about the Du Bois is, is because history repeats itself. There's no way around it. And it's because we keep falling for the same things because we keep making the same mistakes. But I kind of want to just highlight that it sucks that um, we are looked for when we aren't the problem. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like when we had these things done onto us, but we are looked at as we're supposed to fix it, that we're supposed to be um, the change. When the change ne actually needs to happen externally, needs to happen also with, within these diverse communities. Of course, there's things the Black community can be doing, but there's also, it, it has to be hand in hand. Um, and because there's a disconnect with that, I think um, that's why it, it's, it's kind of scary because you think that that generation is dying off, uh, not to say like that, but they are. But there's a lot of people within our generations that is very much ignorant, that very much um, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree, you know? So I think that's why it's important to bring these pieces from the past to see, you see it happened so long ago in the similarities that that's um, occurring now. It's very parallel. Um, it's actually scary. And just because things are a little more modernized, um, and, and things are a little more inclusive doesn't mean that there is not a whole lot of work to be done. Yeah, I, um, I totally resonate with that. I think just in general, like the education piece, I know I had to do a lot of my own reading and at home got a lot of, you know, education and self-empowerment that I had to take with me out into the real world and just know like, okay, these people don't maybe everyone else doesn't really know who I am, but I have to know who I am. And it's mm -hmm. something that maybe not everyone gets and there should be a space for that. Because if you're not getting it at home or you don't know where to go, it can, you could be lost. And we don't, yeah. <laughs> we, we need everybody. So, and I think everyone, there's space for everyone to be empowered and to have success. Um, and I think that's a big part of it. You know, a lot of us are lost and it's because we're not given, we're not exposed to what we need to be exposed to as black people. And it's like, like you said, like you went and you read and you got a lot of that yourself, but people don't like reading these days. People don't want to read books. They don't want to have to do the work themselves. So it's like, well, how can we bring this knowledge that would be so helpful to these people who, you know, don't really want to read, not interested in reading. And it's like, how, how can we get that? Because they are lost. And then, you know, once you find this knowledge, you find some sort of, like, you know yourself more, like you understand yourself more because you understand your experience and what you've been going through. And I just feel like that's such a big part of it. And it's kind of hard when 
we're not getting it in school like I should feel, I feel like it should be a part of the curriculum because that's the only way it's gonna like get to people and, and it's not just black people and that's my thing like it's not just we, us who need to know about this it's everyone because black history is American history like we've said and everyone should know about the black struggle because it, it affects us all pretty much for the most part you know it's not just us who need to learn about our history it's white people who need to learn about their their history the real the truth about their history mm. and you know they don't even want to take the time to look at these not all white people i'm not saying all white people but a lot of white people don't want to acknowledge what these authors have been saying and what black people have been saying for centuries now like it's just a lot of denial and i think that's the most frustrating part it is because you know we can do the work ourselves but at the same time if the oppressors aren't going to you know look at themselves in the mirror and, and realize what they're doing it's like well how not how like how how much how much do our efforts you know really count if if you know we're not going to be able to get the other side to you know work with us and and that's the hard part which i'm finding now is you know do we want to work within the system or do we want to get rid of the system and i feel like you know we're not going to be able to just abolish the police and abolish prisons i feel like maybe eventually but not right away and I feel like that's why reform is the way to go and to keep filtering black people into these systems and filtering them into into different places until we're at a point where there's enough of us there to maybe you know come up with something of our own but I feel like it's hard because you you don't want to play their game but then you have to I feel <laughs> I don't want to like hold you guys but I do want to ask you guys' opinion on like colorism and how we stop you know what I mean? How we can kind of come more unified because the colorism thing is real. Um, yeah, and I, I do want to hear you guys' perspective on that, but I know that time is time is ticking. So yeah. um, um, if you guys want to touch on it, yeah. Real quick, I guess we can do it real quick. Um, <laughs> I um, and my mother is, is high yellow, light skin. So is my older sister. Um, and I've never uh, really kind of had to deal with um, a, a separation. You know, she never, my, they never felt, made me feel any type of, it, was, it wasn't different, right? But um, I do see a lot in the media and that's what I have consumed that, you know, what is deemed to be better, what is deemed to be um, pushed to the forefront. And even the music I listen to, and I think that's kind of um, where a lot of it came from. Like when I was growing up, a lot of Little Wayne, and he was infamous for talking about a red bone. You know what I'm saying? But his daughter, his daughter is as blind as him. You know what I'm saying? And, and I remember being like sixth, seventh grade, like you know that these girls don't look like me. These vixens don't look like me. And I'm saying that I was trying to emulate all that, but that was what I enjoyed. It's still the music that I enjoy. Um, but as a woman of browner complexion, and even me, I'm not even as, you know what I'm saying, I've seen women of much darker skin than me, you know. Um, but I, I just remember, like, playing tennis in the summer and, and hate getting so dark, you know what I'm saying? And, and that's an issue, because why? Why is, and, and, that, and this is at a young age that these things are instilled in you, and it's very subtle. Like, some uh, people are in, for, in unfortunate cases where they have those things thrown in their face, but to have it subtle about things that they show in movies or in TV shows, who's the, when they do finally have um, a Black family on a show, who is the love interest? Who is, who's playing these daughters? You know what I'm saying? Like, it's always light skin and mom, dark skin and dad. I, I kid you not, that's always, that's I feel like, the, the narrative, you know? And yeah. it didn't have to be in my face. It didn't have to be in real time. I saw in the media what was um, deemed to be better, and it wasn't what I looked like. So I don't know. Um, I think the Black community, because that's the thing. Colorism is not just a Black thing. This is in India. This is in uh, Asia. Well, Asia is the continent. So this is in Asia. This is in everywhere. You know what I'm saying? In South America, like, it, it's not just an American issue. Um, and I wish we can stop making it just, like, oh, this is something that only happens that, like, Black women are being extra about something. And yet, no, this is women. This is everywhere. You know what I'm saying? But I don't, what can we do to, to, to make it better, to highlight it? I don't, I think just keep talking about it. I think um, pushing forward what we think is attractive. You know what I'm saying? So I try to, um, 
you know, just to go on my way to highlight the, the beautiful women that I see on the day to day of darker complexion, whether that be my one of my sisters or whether that be family members or, you know, just what I post on my DL, I, I try to highlight um, just the beauty of all of it, you know, and I think it sucks because as young women, we're already kind of um, conditioned to look deeper into our appearances. So to have the duality of being black and also being a woman and dealing with that on top of it, because men face colorism too, but they try to dust it off and just act like it's, you know, irrelevant or it doesn't really pertain to them, but it, it literally affects, I think it affects everybody. So I think just kind of um, calling our own out on the stuff that they do and that has a lot to do with um uh euro european mm. central and values oh, no. definitely I um i guess what i would have to say is i think one of the big issues with colorism is that many men i'm speaking about black men they feel like um, it's, it's perpetuated a lot from them because they feel like it's just my preference, you know, and it's not just your preference, like your preference is rooted in hatred, self-hatred. And it's like when I was young, like really young, like I already told you my story, whatever, and I just hated my black skin and I'm dark skin. I'm probably dark to my family. And it was just I would always feel I would always feel dark like that was just I always felt negative about it like at some points I didn't I didn't want to go outside in the sun you know I wasn't trying to be darker um you know I just didn't well, I wanted to be lighter like and I saw myself striving for whiteness I didn't even realize it you know I, I used to want my hair to be permed I used to have braids like I used to have cornrows I used to have a puff and I would just want mom perm my hair perm my hair I want my hair to be straight you know but my mom would never perm my hair like when I would go home and like take a little selfie for Instagram I would always like pull my curls down like to stretch them out and make it look straight and like <laughs> take a little picture like that looking crazy but that's just because that's that's what I thought that's what people like that was the image that was pushed like she was saying and so you know it happened so subtly and I, I don't even think people realize which is why they might think it's a preference but everything is just everything is display it in a way like to push white and eurocentric you know beauty standards and i didn't even realize you know like hey i'm looking at all these white people on fan on tv as a kid it's like all white families like i never even thought you know to see a black family so it was just like you get used to all these things and why the what like you said why is it that you want to be lighter or like why is it that there's this pushing for lightness like where does that come from and i think that's a really big issue and a lot of the times when people say oh it's my preference it's not really a preference like why ask yourself why are you preferring dark skin over light skin where does that come from because it's not just you know out of thin air and mm -hmm. historically it, it can be traced back and the division between you know the the light skins and black skin is is a big thing in our community but it's like weird because i don't really know how it started like some people say it's you know from the house slaves and, and the slaves were on the plantation but even black men I find that they, I'm not gonna, they don't benefit from colorism, but they experience it a lot different from black women. Like, mm. um, black men, because they're fetishized by a lot of other races, you know, I don't feel like they get as much of the negative effects as black women do from colorism. And I think that's it's like, and is, is deemed masculine. So, because on a man, it oh. looks more. more mm. like, but on a woman, it's more, probably the same thing, more masculine. You know what I'm saying? It's looked at yeah. more, more and, oh. and that, like, it depends on what sector you're viewing it from. Because on the eyes of police, I'm pretty sure darker black men are probably more killed than lighter skinned men or have yeah. more harsh than lighter skinned men. But then when you flip it on something to do with um, romanticism, it's more like, okay, well, this man is strong. This man is, you know, a protector compared right, to... Right. The, more like well she's more it's it's how the police would view a black man but flipped on love interest you know what I'm saying so now they're viewing the black woman as more aggressive as more mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying like yeah, it, yeah. She has, um, it, but like she said it's so complex like it's it's hard to just really focus on one thing without talking about all of it and how what yeah. different affects one another. yeah that's a, a definitely very intricate conversation just when you talk about colorism and 
your own perspective of who you are because you guys talking about your experiences being told for me like I was told outside the household that I was light-skinned because my mother is is darker and my father is is lighter so I kind of just grew up like I'm black and then walking out my house and people were being like well you're not really black and I'm like what do you mean I'm not really black <laughs> and kind of giving that from outside into these and social media you kind of see yeah. how we put this on we can put this on ourselves because within the home we're all different colors like we grow we grow up with people on our block or on our street or neighbors friends and we're all mixed in but we get fed this image that lighter is better or getting the eurocentric look is going to be more appealing and it's going to be better for you and i think i my whole life i was just like i just want to be black i just want people to see me as black so yeah. i would look at black women and just be like you're gorgeous well, white people see you as black white white people do see me as black so they're not going to see people me. white people don't don't see and that's what I, I was really kind of shocked. I was culture shocked with that in high school. Somebody asked me what security guard I was talking about. I was talking about, and I told them the lighter skin security guard. They don't know the difference between the darker skin security guard and the yeah. lighter skin. Yeah, that's so true. It's like, that is true. I thought that yeah, was so to weird. Them, to them, we're just black. They don't, yeah. they don't know. The that's something I think we don't talk about enough too. Like, while we're doing all this, like inside of our community on the outside they're just targeting all of us right yes. that comes back to the unification yep so but I, 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 what were you saying though um earlier i want to call you miss asha oh my god um well just in terms of the media and how they shape like your perception so even just going off what you had just said white people just see us as black and I remember the first time someone was like yeah I don't see light skin and dark skin and I thought that was so weird and I'm like okay well then you know why is it so focused on in our own communities like why are we so I feel like there's such this rigid idea of what it means to be black and I don't know who's perpetuating it more if it's coming from the outside or if it's coming from within our own communities I feel like it's both equally because like you said, people will tell you like, oh, you don't look black. You're not a black girl. Okay, well, what, is, what does it mean to be black? It doesn't just mean to have dark skin. It doesn't, you know, it's, it's just, I feel like there's a lot of stereotypes that we enforce ourselves, but I don't know, like, how to really counter that within our own communities. Like, because you can't tell somebody they're not black, you know, if they're black, then they're black. And also, I have a question, if you, any of you guys know, like, I know how dominican people like they're considered black or how how, how does that whole thing work um, like trinidadian so with the caribbean aspect of being from saint martin i guess it's a little different than every island has a lot different than imagery. every island has their own imagery. i know like for me like i'm can be seen as dominican or puerto rican depending on who is looking at me and it's it's one of those things where it, it it varies. I know some people will prefer to be like the the light to be light, and they see that as better, depending on who you talk to. But usually, they all have African ancestry, so it's either a denial of it, uh, you don't talk about it, it's not a conversation, saying that you're Spanish, and at the end of the day, it's like. I, I, I did a, like a podcast on it with the organization from my school and um, basically we talked about how it's more so um, nationality in these islands rather than um, we had no choice but to look at it as race because our nation is America and we have been divided within that America you know what I'm saying because it was very black and white in the states um, that's why we look at it a little differently than they might, um, as being black, they might in the DR because it's nationality. They don't look at it as, um, light skin and, and dark skin. They, they do have colorism a hundred and a thousand percent, but, um, it, they're all are Dominican. You know what I'm saying? That they have that commonality because we are divided by race. It makes all of our, those issues a little more potent, a little more, um, obvious. 
And I think that's why I have that denial because they are Dominican, regardless of them being dark. And they might get told that they are uglier because they are dark or they might have a, a lower chance of succeeding because they are dark. They are still considered. They, they don't make those um, uh, things like that. They do, like I said, separate light and dark. And they do have a certain hierarchy compared to complexion. That they all are. They, they're very about their natural. To us, we like we don't care about America. You know what I'm saying? Like, they just, <laughs> yeah, right. it's how we feel. Like, you know, that they don't have that there. It's no, there's no such thing as race there. It, it's nationality. So that's why it's a little hard for Black Americans. Um, not hard for us, but you know, when we see a Dominican in denial, it's like uh, that's a funny term, Dominican in denial. Um, you just see denial of like being. African though, like or having African ancestry, not that they're Dominican, right? Denial that about their blackness. You know what I'm saying? Okay. They they as to, and being Black American is is a little more different because there's people who come from Africa and look at Black Americans differently. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, people, they, I, it's there's all this in just within our diaspora. There's different. Right. Ache, can you talk about your viewpoint? Because I know you've been to the Dominican Republic when you went there. Well. Yeah, but you know what? It's it's kind of weird to have those conversations because everybody speaks Spanish, you know. So I'm I'm literally when I was over there, I'm literally just trying to communicate, you know. And then I remember I did get to, you know, I did see some of that a little bit because if you even bring up Africa or some people <laughs> might joke that you look African, you know what I mean? There might be little jokes like that or. Um, like, like, say you're Haitian, but you're light, you're, you're lighter, a lighter skin tone Haitian, you might not tell people that you're Haitian at all, because there's a whole Haitian versus Dominican thing going on, too. What I am noticing, being in St. Martin right now, what I'm noticing is exactly what Quran said about um, people not understanding that when you're Black in America, you don't necessarily... It's like, yes, you're American, but you don't necessarily consider yourself American. We could, we really could care less about the nationality part. And in the island, um, people don't really understand that. And often, I don't even know if people understand that how frustrating that is to, you know, you cannot bundle us into the American. <laughs> like, oh, all Americans, da 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 we talk the same way about Americans because we don't, we kind of put our, us, ourselves aside and they put ourselves us aside so many times to where we're looking outside of America and pointing the finger too. But people want to group us because um, I, th there is a strong nationality like in the island. You're definitely going to rep your flag, you know what I mean? I don't want to rep my flag. <laughs> that, that's a huge difference right there, you know? It's huge. Yeah, I'll rep the Haitian flag. I'll rep, you know, uh, the Unity St. Martin flag, you know, stuff like that. But uh, I want to, if I'm going to rep a flag that's personal to me, it's going to be the Pan-African flag. It's not going to be the American flag. And so just right there, when you're having those, like, discussions about race, just like you said, like, it can get very sticky just because people don't necessarily know what we're going through over there and because also my lens on race and stuff and um separating separating nationality from race so yeah. it can get sticky yeah 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 we're gonna try to wrap up i really appreciate you guys coming on and having this conversation with us hopefully we can have more of these um you know you, yeah. you said visionary i think that's great work and i like to see where it goes in the future if anyone well, has you. last comment no, just thank you for giving us the opportunity to, you know, come on here and talk about it. And I, I really did enjoy this discussion. And you always learn something new. I learned a couple of things just by talking about this. And I, I definitely think more things like this need to happen. So, right. I agree. Um, I think this is the perfect time to also thank you two and Asha because I wouldn't have known about none of this. <laughs> and, you know, until she just, you know, just gave me her hand. So I'm just really appreciative that we have, we can do this. And, and, and even though quarantine is probably not what everyone, you know, thought it would be, but I, I think it was on purpose that we had this time to talk because maybe it wouldn't have happened without it. So 
Um, thank you, ladies, just for allowing me to get some things off my chest. Um, and it, it's just really appreciative. Yeah, okay. I was definitely able to do some healing. Okay, guys. Ladies. All right. Bye. Bye. Happy Sunday. Prosperity to all of you guys.